People might be interested to know that uh, earlier today, I, uh, I was at a, a conference held by the um, ACI, the uh, Authority for Clinical Innovation, and they were having a meeting on Action 11 uh, from the plan to implement the recommendations of the report into seclusion, restraint and observation in New South Wales that was delivered late last year. Um, and Action 11 is about um, engaging consumers and carers in their care planning um, in the manner that helps us to reduce or eliminate the need for seclusion and restraint in mental health services. And it was just uh, something that uh, Clover said before about uh, how do you operationalise uh, engagement and so on in care planning. I'd just like to say that it's become very apparent from what's happened in this project so far that health hasn't really given much thoughts about how you practically engage people in care planning and down to the uh, tools that we have in our electronic <coughs> medical record system. Um, it's not actually very easy to um, meet with a consumer, discuss their care, develop a plan and then get that information onto the medical record where every clinician who has a part in that plan, if someone has complex needs, is aware of what their role is. And so the good news is that it seems that these very, very crucial practical barriers to the implementation of um, person-centred, trauma-informed, recovery-oriented care are now finally being understood and hopefully will be addressed. Because if we give the clinicians the tools, they will do a fantastic job in helping to promote recovery in New South Wales. So, uh, <clears throat> just on that note, now everyone's back at their seat, uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, introduce Dr. Ellie Marceau. Uh, uh, Dr. Marceau is Clinical Coordinator and Research Fellow at the Project Air, for Strategy Person uh, Project Air Strategy for Personality Disorders based at the University of Wollongong. She completed her PhD in Clinical Psychology also at the University of Wollongong. This investigated a group intervention <coughs> designed to improve cognition and self-regulation for people experiencing long-term problems with drug and alcohol use. Uh, she is a clinical psychologist with experience working with personality disorder and consumers with complex needs. Her research in, uh, interests include investigating how psychotherapy actually works. Uh, we know it does and that's enough. <laughs> uh, <coughs> and neurobiological and neuropsychological factors involved in the treatment of personality disorders. So I'd like you to uh, welcome her to the stage. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians and owners of the land on which we meet, um, both past and present. And look, I mean, this is a really uh, inspirational event. Um, it's fantastic to be here. We've heard about the incredible work being done to end stigma towards BPD. And we've heard a little bit about some of the challenges in implementing treatment. And I guess what I want to talk to you about now is something a little bit different. And it's actually looking a bit at what the research and what the science is teaching us about how treatment actually works. And so my talk is titled BPD and the Brain, the Neuroscience of Treatment. So look, as Jonathan mentioned, I'm from the Project Air Strategy. Um, you've heard a little bit about us already. If you want to know more, you can go to our website. And there's also a whole range of information and resources available across a really, really wide range um, of helpful topics. So I'd encourage you to visit it if you haven't been there already. I'd also like to acknowledge the staff of Project Air, both um, past and present, because there's a huge um, volume of people that contribute to the work that we do. And of course, there's a number of expert project consultants. You'll see that a number of them are here. So, you know, these are people that really improve and enhance the quality of our work and who are absolutely critical in what we do. Here is this mass of jelly, three pound mass of jelly you can hold in the palm of your hand. And it can contemplate the vastness of interstellar space. 
It can contemplate the meaning of infinity and it can contemplate itself contemplating on the meaning of infinity. So this is a quote by a famous neuroscientist called V.S. Ramachandran and he's talking of course about the incredible human brain. The brain that changes itself in the famous words of this um, book which is talking about brain plasticity and adaptability and the incredible resilience of this thing that's inside our skull. And this evening I want to give you a very brief whirlwind tour into neuroscience. Then I want to talk a bit about BPD in particular and the brain. Before moving on to what science can teach us about how psychotherapy works and what all of this means in terms of improving our treatments for BPD. This is a whirlwind tour of the history of neuroscience and you can see that the brain has been on our minds for a pretty long time. So in 400 BC, Hippocrates, the Greek physician and the father of Western medicine, understood that a lot of our experiences, both positive and negative, originate from the brain. But it really wasn't until much later, in the early 1800s, that we began to understand how the brain works and the fact that different parts of the brain are responsible for different things, like memory and emotions, for example. Also around this time was the development of a system known as phrenology, which you've probably seen. It's um, kind of considered to be a pseudoscience now, but back then was quite revolutionary because it traced all of these really particular things to different parts of the brain. And another thing that taught us a lot about how the brain works is studies of people that had had brain injuries. So a really famous case is someone known as Phineas Gage, who was a railway worker that had an injury where, unfortunately, a spike went through his frontal lobe. He survived, he made a good recovery, but he had some significant changes in his personality. And so it was things like this that taught us a little bit more about how different parts of the brain are responsible for different things. But really, it wasn't until as recent as 1906 that the Spanish neuroscientist Santiago Ramón y Cajal became known as the father of modern neuroscience and won the Nobel Prize. So some of the work that he did was actually investigate the cells of the brain, the minute structures called neurons and how they're connected. And in his investigations, he made a whole bunch of actually really beautiful artworks that resemble roots and forests and trees. And this was his way of kind of illustrating to the public kind of what he had found. But of course, the other thing that was happening is was major um, advances in technology the machinery that we can use to actually look inside the brain and see what's going on. So you can see here that it wasn't until fairly recently, the 1980s and the 1990s, that something known as fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, um, came to the fore. So we really haven't had this technology for that long. But and here we go, this is actually a chart of phrenology, so you can see this is some of the kind of early understanding of the brain. But now we have moved into a much more nuanced understanding because we have all of this technology that lets us look inside the skull. But where we're at right now is not so much mapping the brain in terms of particular areas. We're starting to look a bit more um, at the brain as a whole and focus a bit more on how different parts are connected to other parts. So in other words, there's 86 billion neurons in the brain and in theory, the connectome is all possible connections between those, which is kind of mind-boggling. But we can also look at the connections between larger areas. So that was the whirlwind tour of neuroscience. And now we're moving on to looking at BPD a little bit more in detail. And I just want to start here with uh, the Project AIR biopsychosocial model that talks about the development of personality disorder and how it actually occurs, how people become vulnerable to these problems. So we know that it occurs across the lifespan, that there are factors even before birth that can influence um, development. Um, for example, we know that maternal smoking can be harmful and actually cause epigenetic changes. 
But broadly speaking, we know that um, it's both a combination of genetic and environmental factors that I guess, you know, plays a role in the development of these problems. The genetic component is estimated to be about 40 to 60%. And in the environment, we're looking at the effects not only of negative events, but also positive events. And really, it is the contribution of both of these broad things, genetic and environment, that then have an influence in terms of biological and psychosocial factors, both early in life and also later on. So for example, we know that infant temperament is really important. Um, this is basically, you know, how easily settled um, an infant is. And, you know, we already heard a little bit about um, this idea of borderline personality disorder as hypersensitive souls. So some infants are actually hypersensitive to their environment and they're really difficult um, to soothe. But of course, we know that this also interacts with the role of the caregiver and the emotional bond or attachment that um, develops between them. And also we know that later in life that um, people with borderline personality disorder do show some differences in terms of how their brains are functioning. Um, they have a neurobiologically sensitive system. And basically we know that in terms of these um, factors here, what this manifests in is core mechanisms that um, are part of the disorder. So broadly speaking, their problems with emotion regulation, with a person's um, sense of self and sense of who they are, and also with their capacity to, um, you know, be involved in relationships. And often, um, you know, there are difficulties in terms of a hypersensitivity to rejection, um, and actually a hypersensitivity to other people's emotions in general. Um, so really, it's these core mechanisms that kind of, you know, lead to the symptoms emerging and everyone has a really unique profile of symptoms um, that you can see down here. But also importantly, the core mechanisms are actually what we target with effective treatment. They're actually the things that we look to improve. So now I want to turn and focus a little bit more on the role of epigenetics because this is really interesting and there's a lot happening in this space at the moment. So like I said, um, trauma early on is related to negative psychological outcomes later in life, but this relationship is quite complex and it's certainly not linear. And the reason for this is that we all have an incredibly unique genetic and environmental profile. And traditionally, people have thought a lot about a genetic vulnerability. But that really doesn't capture the whole story. And what people are thinking about now is that, well, it's actually not just vulnerability to negative events. You can think of it as a sensitivity to the environment at the genetic level. And so this means that, well, it's not only negative events, but it's also positive experiences that someone can be sensitive to. And I think, you know, this is really important because often in the research we've only focused on negative events, but we need to start looking at what the resilience factors are here as well. So basically, our genetic expression is incredibly dynamic across our whole lifetime. And this gives us, um, I guess, a lot of opportunity to intervene and a lot of, um, I think, hope. So epigenetics is basically the way that our genetic inheritance can be modulated. And it's pretty complicated, I don't really understand at all, but basically it's the way that cells can adapt to changes in their environment. And this quote here illustrates um, this idea emerging in the literature at the moment is that psychotherapy can actually produce epigenetic changes, which I think is pretty powerful. So we started to wonder about this at Project Air. We do a lot of um, different things and research is one of them. We started to want to understand the neuroscience of psychotherapy a little bit more. So what we did was conduct a systematic review to look at all possible studies that have investigated um, both 
I guess, brain changes and also genetic changes that um, come about as a, as a result for, um, of psychotherapy for BPD. So you can see here that we started off identifying um, about 8,000 potential studies and we sorted through these, it took a little while. And what we came up with in the end was that there were only 14 studies out there to date that have looked at this kind of thing. So basically we had data from about 500 participants with a diagnosis of BPD. Most of them were female and receiving um, or taking part in DBT uh, treatment in the community. Um, nearly half of them were conducted in Germany, which is interesting. And um, basically the field is only 20 years old, but nearly half of the studies have been conducted in only the last two years. So, now I just want to show you a little about um, the kinds of studies that were part of this review. So we had three genetic and 11 that looked at um, neuroimaging. And basically there was one study that looked at the structure of the brain and we had 10 studies that looked at um, the function. So basically there were a range of different methods that were used and I've um, pictured them here just for your interest. But I want to turn now to the findings because I think um, this is actually really important. We, we did identify that psychotherapy has the capacity to actually change brain functioning. Like, wow. <laughs> so <laughs> the one study that looked at brain structure actually found that participants that received DBT compared to people who received treatment as usual showed increased grey matter volume at follow-up in these particular regions of the brain. And the studies that looked at brain function, so what they did is they got participants in these scanners and they basically got them to conduct some tasks so that they could look at how their brains light up. And um, these tasks were kind of like looking at emotional pictures, using different regulation strategies, things like that. But basically we found that in some areas there were decreases in brain activity, in other areas there were increases. It was also possible to predict from imaging someone at baseline um, the people that were more likely to have a favourable response in terms of their clinical outcome. And we did also find that the people that um, did have a better response to treatment than others, they did show a particular profile here. So look, I realise this is a lot of kind of info to take in, but what I want to do now is just jump into, well, what, like this is all well and good, but what does it really mean? So just for your knowledge, I've got a um, map of the brain here which shows you where a lot of these changes were taking place. So what you'll notice straight away is that there's a lot of areas in the prefrontal part of the brain and there's also some, I guess, more in the subcortical lower areas of the brain, which is more so the limbic system that's involved in um, detecting and responding to emotions. So these areas are broadly part of networks that are involved in emotion regulation. And basically what we saw when we reviewed these studies is that People with borderline personality disorder often have a hyperactive amygdala, so their response to threat is really automatic and really heightened and really, um, you know, what feels like uncontrollable at times. But what we found is the amygdala activation levels actually reduced and returned. Like, you know, people are having the improvements in the symptoms, but we're actually looking at, well, and this is what's happening in the brain to, um, you know, illustrate this. So we also know that the amygdala is involved in helping a person to evaluate how relevant uh, something is in relation to their goals, particularly in an in ambiguous situation. Um, you can also see that the anterior cingulate cortex um, was involved. So um, basically what we, what we found there, particularly the dorsal part, which is towards the top of the brain, um, look, this is involved in kind of, I guess, the brain calculating how much control it's going to exert over a particular um, emotional response and what the value of putting that effort and that energy is um, into that response. 
So look, in a nutshell, we're seeing that, um, broadly speaking, we have greater control arising from the prefrontal and the anter anterior cingulate cortex over these um, emotionally hyper-responsive parts that are lower in the brain. And now I just want to turn very briefly to what the three genetic studies found. Um, so basically one of them looked at gen like natural patterns of genetic um, variation that exist in, in uh, the environment and found that um, in terms of these two genes here, the DRD4 and the CERT genes, people that had a particular um, variation compared to another variation did display a better um, engagement in treatment versus people that did not. Um, but I think the, the other two studies were really interesting because they were looking at epigenetic changes that I mentioned earlier. And the thing that they focused on was the methylation profile of these particular genes. And basically they found that even in a short period of time when someone is completing four weeks of GBT treatment, we're actually seeing epigenetic changes. And I'll just add that there is one more study that has come out since we have published this review, which also looked at um, methylation of the BDNF gene. But instead of using um, a blood sample to look at methylation, it used a saliva sample. Um, it found the same thing, that following um, DBT treatment, methylation profiles were changed. Okay, so nearly finished. Um, how can this treat, how can um, all of this that we're finding out, how can it actually improve treatment for BPD? Well, this is objective evidence showing us what we know already is that treatment works, but this is why it works, because it's actually changing the brain and changing our epigenetic expression. Um, and I think basically when we get under the hood here and we're looking at how psychotherapy works, it helps us to have a more fine-grained understanding. And the ideal is that over time and with a lot more studies, we can translate this into, I guess, looking at the variability of the individual, how everyone has such a different profile and how we can actually match up the best particular treatments to the individual. Um, I think it also helps us to develop our prevention and our early intervention work, which is so important by looking at where the vulnerabilities are earlier and how to find them so that we can then give the best treatment at the best time. Um, and I also think it helps us develop to, to develop uh, new types of treatment for BPD. Um, for example, something um, called cognitive remediation is um, traditionally used for people with schizophrenia to help them improve their brain functioning. Um, but there aren't that many st studies out there that have actually looked at applying this to BPD, so it would be really interesting to see whether we can actually identify where the problems are in the brain and we can develop um, a particular treatment to help people with their particular problems, um, wherever they happen to be in their brain. Um, so look, in terms of, I guess, where the, a summary and where the field is heading, um, I think this is really exciting, this area of research, because it's about being collaborative and getting neuroscientists to join the conversation with people that are delivering treatment. And also, of course, we need the consumer voice, we need the lived experience voice as well. We want to bring all levels of experience and expertise together so that we can understand this really complex thing, which is, I guess, the brain-mind connection. Because how is it that we've got this three-pound mass of jelly, right, which is also incredibly adaptable to the fact that our subjective experience and taking part um, in psychotherapy and talking to someone about um, it, our experience can actually change the brain physically. Um, a big question in the field at the moment is whether different types of psychotherapy for BPD um, actually work on the brain differently or have common, um, I guess, pathways through which they're working. And look, one final, final note here is that um, everything I've spoken about so far in terms of these findings has looked at the one individual in a brain scanner and how the individual brain of a person works. But of course, we know that we live in a rich social world 
our brains develop in terms of social experiences. <laughs> and so there's a real new field out there called social neuroscience, which is actually looking at how can we develop the technology to image two brains um, in conversation? And I guess really it is um, a relational approach to this kind of neuroscience. I think it's really important in BPD because we're talking about something that is um, very much linked to a person's relational experience. And um, I think that this particular field and its development holds a lot of promise to um, inform what we're doing in this space. So I think I'm finished there, and I'm yeah happy to answer any questions that you might have. Hi. Have you done any studies on identical twins? Any I studies on identical twins? Yes. Yeah. Um, Look, um, I guess we, we haven't personally as a lab, but I know that in terms of the genetic studies that are out there, um, look, I think that there are studies that have looked at um, that kind of genetic overlap between identical twins. And I think that, you know, it does have the potential for us to learn things about um, genetic expression, like particularly if identical twins have one been... One has one and one doesn't. Yeah, yeah have been, you know, dif different, um, yeah, experiences of problems or have had different um, environments in which they've been raised for whatever reason, so... Yeah. Mm. Hi. Um, hi, just with the... And I work in mental health as well, so what I'm curious about is a bit like ADHD, uh, not ADHD, Asperger's screening for... And I guess the diagnostic clarification becomes interesting because adolescence comes into it and you've got all the brain changes that take place during that sort of extended period of time. Mm -hmm. and, and a bit like with ADHD, which you can't really diagnose until about five, you know, six or seven until the symptoms are kind of very clear, whether that would apply to BPD because you could screen for it early mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. and start to provide certain treatments that may... Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a really important point because you're right. Can we have that summarised? We didn't hear any. No. Can we have that summarised? What you just said? Oh, sure, sure. So, um, I guess he's talking about um, the idea of how people um, can be identified um, at an early stage using screening methods, um, and talking about how there's been work done. I think in. Um, ADHD, for example. So, um, look, I think the it's a really good point because as we learn a bit more about the vulnerability factors um, in borderline personality disorder, hopefully it will allow us to identify them earlier um, because we know that the earlier someone can receive treatment or what they need, um, the better outcome they can have. Um, so I think that, you know, hopefully, I think there's still a lot more that we need to know. Um, the other point you mentioned was in terms of diagnostic clarification. And I think that this kind of research, when you, you know, get under the hood a little bit and look at what's actually going on in the brain, it can potentially help us with diagnostic clarification because we know that there's continual debate about how we diagnose, um, you know, borderline personality disorder. So. Hopefully this can um, lead to, you know, helpful changes in finding out, yeah, how to diagnose it and how to identify it early and, you know, ultimately to be able to link people up to the best particular treatments for them. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, and that really reinforces what the talk in Brisbane was about with the neuroplasticity with validation so even before treatment starts like if, if they're in a positive validating environment um, if families can get skilled up mm. um, what a difference it makes on the person's brain yeah absolutely i think that's a really good point yeah. really important because families can learn to do a lot to um to help people and particularly people that have this genetic sensitivity there's actually research suggesting that people with a sensitivity like that, well, they could be even more sensitive to positive environmental experiences than people without that 
sensitivity. So it's not just that they're vulnerable to negative experiences, but they could be much more positive, um, sensitive to positive experiences than the norm. Hmm. Might take, uh, we are running a little bit short of time, so we might just take uh, one more question. <coughs> Uh, My question was just how do we access the review that you was in your um, presentation? I'd yeah, love to read it. yeah, I'm happy to make that available to um, everyone, and I'm just wondering what the best way to do that would be. If, if you uh, if you send it to us, we will yeah. email it to all yeah. participants. Yeah, tonight. okay, we'll do. Uh, thank you very much. Uh,